Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Now we're going to continue with The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Last time we introduced Chapter 8 of the book, and in this chapter we're going to discuss the infallibility of the Pope before the decree of papal infallibility of 1870. If this sounds confusing, we'll get to it and explain everything. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the Pope's temporal power, not divine. That is the kingly authority of the Pope, the power to persecute, the power as a ruler, a dictator, was not divinely given to the papacy. And now and then we're going to talk about the Italian people, particularly those of the papal states and how they lived under papal domination. We're going to talk about the government of the papal states, the Je and we're going to talk about Jesuitism. It's very important to our understanding of the papacy today is to understand Jesuitism because it is Jesuitism that controls the papacy. We're going to talk about mutilation of books that has historically been the jurisdiction of the papacy to destroy books that run counter to the teaching of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to talk about union of church and state by Constantine. Remember, the Constantinian ruler of Rome, the Roman Empire, who united the church and the state and gave authority to the church. Uh, we're going to talk about his grant of supposition, uh, suppositions, <laughs> a word I can't pronounce, suppositions, I'll just put it that way. I think we're going to talk about the, uh, the donation of Constantine. In other words, the very foundation of the temporal authority of the papacy. We're going to show how it's a human invention and not a divine invention. And speaking again of Constantine, he, said, he says he did not unite the Church of Rome. And Rome was governed by imperial officers, and the apostles had no temporal power. Okay, a hodgepodge of subjects in this book, but I'm sure, or in this chapter of the book, but I'm sure that if you'll listen carefully, you'll be able to assimilate it all and make sense of it. And most importantly, the goal of the listeners of Inquisition Update should be to recognize what is being said in this book and examine the current state of affairs in the world to see if anything has changed or if the new world order really is the reestablishment of the old world order. That's the thesis of this book. Now, beginning at the top of page 226, if you're following along, it says, It was asserted by Protestants generally, before the decree of papal infallibility was passed, that if that doctrine could ever obtain the approval of a general council of the Roman Catholic Church, it would be employed to advance the favorite theory of the Jesuits that the spiritual power of the Pope also includes the temporal as one of its necessary incidents, inasmuch as it belongs to the primacy of Peter and was divinely conferred upon him. Okay, the, the assertion is that the Jesuits are the ones who believe that Peter was given not only some spiritual authority as, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, but that he was given kingly authority. In other words, he had the power of civil government also in his jurisdiction. That they call the primacy of Peter. And the papacy, is, uh, uh, through Jesuit influence, asserts that same uh, ecclesiastical and civil authority on the pope who is believed in the Roman Catholic Church to be a successor of Peter by divine right. All right, the Jesuits themselves practiced no duplicity upon this question, 
but openly asserted their doctrine with a confidence which would now seem to have been awakened by a perfect knowledge of their power over all the authorities of the church, including the Pope. All right, R.W. Thompson makes the assertion that the Jesuits exert their authority both over the Roman Catholic Church and over the papacy. The uh, well-trained rowers as uh, R.W. Thompson has described him, described them elsewhere. In other words, they are leading the Pope to world domination, and occasionally they have to rein in the papacy and get it back on track. The leaders of the Roman Catholic Church are the Jesuit order, and the papacy takes its orders from the Jesuits, and this will become clear as we continue in the book. Speaking again of the Jesuits, it says their boldness won them the victory, and they are now complete masters of the situation. All the energies of the Roman Catholic Church, insofar as the Pope is enabled to arouse them, are placed under their guidance. Okay, The Pope functions to keep the Church and himself under the guidance of the Jesuit order. And even the venerable pontiff himself is spending the close of a long and honorable life in endeavoring to establish the doctrine they have maintained so earnestly, that is, the Jesuits have maintained so earnestly as an essential and indispensable part of the true faith. All right, as the essential and indispensable part of the true faith, that is, Roman Catholicism, the Pope has temporal power, the power of a king. He's not just a preacher, okay? He's not just a bishop. He's not just over ecclesiastical things. He's not just the spiritual head of the Roman Catholic Church. He is a king. And the Jesuits make sure that he that his temporal authority, his kingly authority, is never diminished anywhere in the world. All right, the part of the the reason they they created this this uh, papal infallibility was to put all the emphasis on the Pope. Okay, if 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 it could be said by someone that the Roman Catholic Church at one time was not a popish church. That can no longer be said. Ever since the Council of Trent, when the Jesuit order was created, the papacy took primacy in the Roman Catholic Church, both as a priest and a king. Now, he continues, he says, with his vanity flattered, we're speaking about the Pope, with his vanity flattered by their caresses, by the Jesuits' caresses, and persuaded to believe that he stands in the place of God on earth, he omits no opportunity of declaring that he has been appointed by divine decree to direct and regulate all such secular affairs as pertain in any way to the Roman Catholic Church, its faith, its discipline, and the universality of its sovereignty. The universality of the sovereignty of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. And it says, of those within the Roman Catholic Church who were unwilling to accept this doctrine, that is, papal primacy or papal infallibility, there were two classes. One, denying the infallibility of the Pope and claiming it only for the universal church. In other words, they didn't mind believing in infallibility, but they applied that infallibleness to the universal church, in other words, the Pope together with the, the councils, together with the, uh, the bishops, and it was kind of a, a group infallibility. When they all spoke with one voice, then they were considered to be infallible. Okay, they were willing to believe in the, in the infallibility of the universal church, but they were unwilling to believe in the infallibility of the Pope, in other words, the primacy of the Pope that all the infallibility of the church was vested in the Pope, they did not believe. And it says, and the other, 
speaking of these two classes now, and the other insisting that if it were recognized, this, this papal infallibility, it would confer no temporal power upon the Pope because it was not necessarily included in the spiritual and had not been divinely established as an incidence of the primacy of Peter. So two classes of Roman Catholics stood out against papal infallibility those who believed that only infallibility existed in the universal church, a union of the Pope and of the bishops, and the other who recognized papal infallibility, but that it did not include the kingly power of the Pope. Okay? I hope that helps you make sense of this. Now, to this latter class, those who denied the Pope uh, temporal power, to this latter class, it may be fairly said, belonged a considerable port, portion, if not a majority, of the Roman Catholics of the United States. These had not yet felt the tremendous pressure of the Jesuit power and honestly endeavored by this argument to remove what they considered to be Protestant prejudice against their church. It was not composed entirely of laymen, but included some of the prelates and clergy who were not yet prepared to turn over the church to the Jesuit dominion. They could not see how it was possible if God had made the temporal, the temporal power of the Pope an appendage to the spiritual power of the Pope that so many centuries would have elapsed without its announcement by the church in some authoritative form. And they were encouraged by this by the highest ecclesiastical authority in the United States. All right. Now we're going to outline a personage called Archbishop Kenrick of Baltimore, a very, very powerful Jesuit center in the United States, Baltimore, Maryland, Archbishop Kenrick, who raised his voice against this papal infallibility. Now, before my listeners begin to think that this Archbishop Kenrick was genuine in his beliefs, I want to remind my listeners that the papacy often speaks out of both sides of its mouth. And it's necessary for the papacy to do this, especially when regarding the papal infallibility and the Pope's temporal power, that the, that someone within the Roman Catholic Church stand up to kind of, kind of uh, squelch the... the uh, well, in other words, they don't want to raise the suspicion of Protestants in this country. So they have to throw the Protestants a bone so as to alleviate their concerns. And this is what I believe the real intent of Archbishop Kenrick of Baltimore was. The author is preparing us for what we're about to hear by saying that there was a group, a very large group of Roman Catholics in this country who did not believe that the Pope, though he be infallible, had any temporal or kingly power. In other words, no power to control the government. All right. Now, in 1848, Archbishop Kenrick of Baltimore prepared for the press a treatise on the primacy of the papacy in which great learning and ability are displayed. It was published in that year, and a sixth revised edition was also published in 1867. When he comes to speak of the relations between the Pope and secular affairs, he begins his first chapter on the patrimony of Peter with this, emphasis, with this emphatic sentence, quote, The primacy, that is the primacy of the Pope, is essentially a spiritual office and has not of divine right any temporal appendage. In other words, when, we're, when, when Kenrick spoke or pretended to speak about the primacy of Peter he, or the primacy of the Pope, the Pope being the successor of Peter, it didn't include any kingly authority, only spiritual authority. 
Now, this is running directly counter to what the Jesuits are teaching. Now, I, I, remind, my, my, I remind my listeners once again that this Archbishop Kenrick is from Baltimore, one of the most powerful Jesuit centers in this country. And I find it untenable that this Archbishop Kenrick, though he denies the temporal power of the Pope, denied it for any other purpose than to put down or to alleviate some of the Protestant concerns in this country. Okay, we don't want another Protestant Reformation taking place in the United States of America just when the Pope is claiming infallibility. All right? So you can take this as you please, but I still reserve the caution of uh, the teaching of this Archbishop Kenrick. I believe he's just as much Jesuit-influenced as is the Pope. And he's performing his function of trying to alleviate undue concern by Protestants. You know, put the Protestants back to sleep. But we in the background are going to continue to raise the Pope and increase his temporal power, even in the United States, even to the point of eventually overthrowing the Constitution and making America a Roman Catholic. Okay? So Kenrick is playing a very strategic role here. That's my assertion. You can, uh, you can read the book for yourself and see if you can come to a different conclusion. He quotes, he says, The primacy of the Pope is essentially a spiritual office and has not of divine right any temporal appendage. And, quote, The small principality in Italy, unquote, now he's talking about the papal states where the Pope was a king, and everybody knew he was a king over the papal states, not just a spiritual leader, but he was the king of kings and lord of lords over the papal states. It said, the small principality in Italy, the papal states, over which he is sovereign, he says, des designated the patrimony of Peter on account of his having, uh, uh, account of its having been attached to the pontifical office through reverence to the Prince of the Apostles, unquote. So, what we're seeing is a doctrine that has been taught in the Roman Catholic Church called the, the Patrimony of St. Peter. That patrimony, or that which belonged to Peter, the temporal power was awarded to the Pope as his successor, and it only then included uh, the temporal power only extended over the Papal States and not over anywhere else. Now, don't you find that a little bit ironic coming from uh, a Roman Catholic Archbishop of Baltimore? <laughs> but that's, that's what he was preaching that the, the, the temporal appendage or the patrimony of Peter, the temporal power of the Pope, was only valid in the Papal States. That was the patrimony of Peter, according to this archbishop. And he declares that this, quote, has no necessary connection with the primacy, unquote. And because, quote, Catholics not living within the Roman States, within the, uh, the uh, Papal States, are not subject to the civil authority of the Pope, unquote. He treated of it no further than to trace its history. And to this we shall have occasion hereafter to refer. So, Archbishop Kenrick is putting down this, this concern, oh, now we American Catholics don't need to get too riled up. The patrimony of Peter... Uh, was transferred to the Pope, yes, indeed, and that's the Papal States where the Pope is the king. And uh, he's not to have any temporal power here in the United States. So we're an independent nation. Okay, We have our own government. Now, do you think the Jesuits are going to sit well with that idea? Not on your life. So Kenrick is just putting out fires. In other words, he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Personally, he truly believes in the temporal power of the Pope, the primacy of Peter, not over just the Papal States, but the whole world. He's a, an archbishop from Baltimore, for heaven's sakes. Let's not forget that. 
Now, he says again, quote, and this is Archbishop Kenrick speaking, quote, in making uh, Peter the ruler of his kingdom, he, that is Christ, did not give him dominion or wealth or any of the appendages of royalty, unquote. Then going on to show that the Bishop of Rome was, was not yet a temporal sovereign at the time of Leo the Great, the middle of the 5th century, he says also at another place that the power of interfering with and regulating the political order in the nations was vested in the popes, quote, by the force of circumstances and was not a divine prerogative of their office, unquote. Now, what Roman Catholic archbishop or bishop or priest in the United States would repeat these words today? See again what the Pope says, quote, The civil sovereignty of the Holy See has been given to the Roman pontiff by a singular council of divine providence. And as regards the relation of the church to the civil society, all the prerogatives and all the rights and authority necessary to governing the universal church have been received by us, the popes, in the person of the most blessed Peter, directly from God himself. Has the faith changed? Did not Archbishop Kenrick understand what it was? Was he a heretic? No. I don't believe he was a heretic at all. I believe he was just speaking out of both sides of his mouth, just like I've asserted. And it says, but this, con this conflict of authority is in no other way important to us than to show how the honest apprehensions of Roman Catholics in the United States were allayed before the Pope's infallibility was announced and to excite to such inquiry as we'll, we will show in reality the temporal power was acquired whether it is of God or of man, whether it was obtained legitimately or by usurpation. This we shall be better prepared to understand the, the thus we shall be better prepared to understand the import of the issues which the papacy has precipitated upon us. They didn't want to lose the Catholics in this country that loved their government of by and for the people. They were, they were rightly concerned about how much power, how much temporal power the Pope might assert here in the United States. And Archbishop Kendrick just simply went out with a bucket of water to cool them off a little while. And now we see the full-blown temporal power of the Pope in this country. Now, Archbishop Kenrick, this uh, this archbishop from the Jesuit hold of Baltimore, Maryland, is allaying fears in the uh, Roman Catholic population, the 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 largest of the two groups that believed in infallibility, but that that didn't include any kingly power. The Pope was infallible when he spoke on matters of faith and morals, but he was not infallible when he exercised his authority as a king, as he did in the Papal States. They did not want in this country the kind of servitude, the kind of tyranny and oppression that was suffered in the Papal States by the, by the subjects of the Pope where the Pope ruled supreme as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They were genuinely concerned about the Pope's uh, temporal power being extended here in the country, and Archbishop Kenrick's out putting out fires. Okay, Archbishop Kenrick did not consider it necessary in his work on the primacy to treat of the Pope's temporal power in Rome any further than to trace its history. Nor was it necessary that he should do so in view of his denial of its divine origin. He did not consider it to be a part of the faith of the church that he or anybody else should believe that it was conferred by Christ upon Peter and had come down through an unbroken line of succession to the present pope. The new order of things, however, the introduction of the new faith, gives great importance to the question. 
Because if it be true that the temporal power of the Pope anywhere is of divine origin, then the new faith is right and the old faith is wrong. And the world may, be, may reasonably expect that either by its own consent or by the providence of God, it may yet be compelled to admit to its universality. If, on the other hand, it had the origins of fraud, usurpation, and imposture, those of us to whom the charge of infidelity is now imputed may breathe more freely. Okay, so if this temporal power of the Pope is truly by divine right, then we ought to repent, right? <laughs> But if, if, if it is, as I assert here at Inquisition Update, that it is a man-made institution, that Satan is behind it all, then we owe it no respect at all. That is the assertion of Inquisition Update. And those of us who assert that can breathe freely because we tell the truth. The infallibility of the Pope is a fraud, there is only one infallible in heaven and, and in earth, that is Christ. And the Pope is an imposter, a man-made substitution, and a very cheap one at best. Okay, the papacy is antichrist. He presumes to replace Christ on the earth. And he most effectively does that by deceiving people into believing he's divinely inspired. A divinely appoint, appointed, and that he serves by divine right. Okay, these are all man-made institutions. Now, continuing, it says, Can it be possible that the Italian people violated the law of God by the act of terminating the Pope's temporal power in the papal states? That's right. In the very time when the Pope was claiming himself universal power, both spiritually and temporally, a sort of global king of kings and lord of lords, right there in the papal states, where the pope's power was supreme and unlimited, they were rebelling against it. There was rebellion against the papacy, against its cruelties. So look at the contrast of what's going on. And it says... and. Uh, can it be possible that the Italian people violated the law of God by the act of terminating the Pope's temporal power in the Papal States and that they have thereby cut themselves off from reasonable hopes of heaven unless they shall restore it? That's right. They were excommunicated. They were putting their own eternal destination in jeopardy by rebelling against this so-called patrimony of Peter in the Papal States. Or were they justified, after the example of the United States, in throwing off the papal yoke and adopting a form of government which, although monarchical, is representative? If the former, if God did make Peter king of Rome and Pope Pius IX his successor in royal authority, then no such justification can exist. Revolution is offensive to God, and every government which has grown out of it must stand accursed at the bar of heaven. Arraigned as we are upon such a charge, both as principles and accessories, we must be allowed the privilege of the most abandoned criminal, the right to plead to the jurisdiction of his triers. It is a common remark of the supporters of the papacy that the civil government of Rome and the papal states by the Pope and his curia was altogether paternal, that it looked carefully after the interests of the people, was most considerate of their happiness, and was in fact one of the best governments in the world. If this were true, it is not easy, according to any ordinary rules of reasoning, to account for the fact that Pope Pius IX has held the temporal scepter during all the years of his long pontificate by an exceedingly frail and uncertain tenure. To him as a king, there could be no strong personal objections. He's represented as a kind-hearted and benevolent, and no doubt truth, uh, truthfully so. 
Even Gavazzi concedes as much. But these very qualities may unfit him for the duties of government by subjecting him to the undue influence of men around him who play upon them, such as undoubtedly been the case. Antonelli, his cardinal secretary of state, is understood to be both ambitious and unscrupulous. Just such a man would, as would hold the curia and all the inferior offices of government in strict subordination to his will. He would, in all probability, have little difficulty in dictating the policy and measures of the administration. If the Pope has ambition, he would excite it. If he has none, he could create it. Thus we may account for their joint efforts to check the current, uh, the current of adverse circumstances which have, during the present pontificate, pressed upon the, pro the papacy and rendered it necessary that the Pope should be held upon his throne by French bayonets. Thus also we may account for the encyclical and syllabus and other papal bulls and briefs wherein the attempt is made to weld religion and politics together and make it appear that the people, however oppressed, have no more right to resist the divine right of kings than they have to, to violate the Ten Commandments. That the papal government was oppressive has been settled by the Italian people, hitherto the most devout Roman Catholics in the world. By their act, that fact, as such, is entitled to a place in history, and that they were justified in it as we were justified in our revolution, a brief recital of facts will abundantly show. The papal states, during the Pope's temporal dominion, were held as religious property, as an ecclesiastical benefice. The people were considered to be so many tenants who occupied and enjoyed the estate on, quote, the condition affixed by the infallible head of the church, for her welfare and not for their own, unquote. They possess no civil rights whatever. Now, as I'm reading this, the condition of the state of affairs in the papal states, when, when the Pope's rule was unquestioned, the conditions that existed in the papal states when the Pope ruled supreme both as priest and as king, Stop and think. This is the very state of affairs, the very condition of the world that will exist when the Pope has that same authority over the entire world and not just the papal states. And then ask yourself as I'm reading, how much of this already exists? And I may from time to time even give you examples as we go along. The papal states, during the Pope's temporal dominion, were held as religious property. Okay? So if the Pope claims global authority as the global King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he will hold the property of the earth as religious property. Okay? You following along this example? He's going to hold the world as an ecclesiastical benefice. Okay, It says the people in the papal states at that time, but think on a global, sta uh, a global level now, the people were considered as so many tenants. Okay, In other words, they didn't own any property. They couldn't own any private property. Any, just ring any bells with any of my, my listeners, anybody who's researching this, anybody who's read Caritas and Veritate, Anybody who's read the book Ecclesiastical Megalomania and some of the other books that are out on this subject, anybody who's read any of the other papal bulls, there's not going to be any private property. The Pope owns it all. Okay? The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. He's taking the place of God on earth. All right? In the papal states, that microcosm of the New World Order macrocosm, the people were just tenants. They had no private property. 
the people were considered as so many tenants who occupied and enjoyed the estate on, quote, the condition affixed by the infallible head of the church for her welfare and not their own, unquote. So the people who existed in the papal states for the, for the benefit of the church. Okay? They enjoyed the papal states not for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the church. The church owned the papal states. The church ruled the papal states spiritually and temporally, and they were for the benefit of the church. The people were just tenants there. Now, they possessed no civil rights whatever in the sense in which the world holds them, but only such privileges as their sovereign, the Pope, thought proper to confer upon them. And these could be changed, modified, or wholly withdrawn at his personal discretion, or whenever the interests of the church should require it. Okay, that's the state of affairs in the Papal States, but don't forget to make the the equation fit to the macrocosm. Okay? The new world in the new world order, the people will possess no civil rights whatever, in the sense that the world holds them, but only such privileges privileges, remember privileges can be taken away or altered or removed altogether. It says they possess no civil rights, whatever, in the sense in which the world holds them, but only such privileges as their sovereign, the Pope, thought proper to confer upon them. And these could be changed, modified, and wholly withdrawn at his personal discretion, or whenever the interests of the Roman Catholic Church would require it. Now, how would that fit in the United States? Well, first of all, you have to completely eliminate the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Okay, If the Pope is going to confer uh, your privileges, uh, whether it be by license or by decree, that's how you will enjoy your privileges. And if the Pope decides that the Church would benefit if you no longer had those privileges, then he can simply alter the privilege or take them away. That's the New World Order. And it's even spelled out in clandestine language within the most recent papal encyclicals. Continuing, it says, If the government was a trust held alone for the benefit of the church, as papists allege, then the people had no right to demand of it anything on their own account. The government was conducted wholly without reference to the people and they were required to submit to whatever it did and to all the laws proclaimed by the papacy. Popular liberty was therefore unknown and was impossible. The papacy alone was free to do as it pleased, and this was called the freedom of the church. Remember, the pope is the church. So if the Pope is free to do whatever he pleases, that is the definition of the freedom of the church, freedom of the Pope. Okay, The people, having thus no voice in public affairs, were in a condition of vassalage. Okay? That's the new world order, global vassalage. The government was a revival. Uh, the government was a revival, with slight exceptions, of the old system of feudalism without its redeeming features. <laughs> yeah, the Papal States were ruled as a fiefdom. Okay? It had all the, the, the tenets of the old feudal system without any of its redeeming features. That's what it was like to live in the Papal States complete tyranny, complete subservience to the vassaling vassalages, the, the, the vacillating will of the Pope. Okay? Now, there was no charge or prom... Uh, excuse me. There was no change or promise of change. Everything moved 
Everything moved on in the old grooves which had been worn by centuries of papal absolutism. A writer who personally observed this says, quote, At every appeal to alienate any part of this sacred estate or to grant any privileges to its subjects on the grounds of their inherent rights, the Pope talks of Constantine and Pepin and the blessed Countess Matilda and shaking his infallible head doggedly, uh, shaking his infallible head doggedly thunders, non possumus. In other words, impossible. Okay? That's just how thorough the tyranny was in the Papal States. Now, there was no written constitution, not even a collection of precedents from which the citizens could learn the extent or the nature of the privileges conceded to them. Okay? I once worked for an employer like that. There was no employee manual. The boss of the place could change the rules at a whim, prefer one employee over another. It was living hell, let me tell you. You couldn't count on anything, and favoritism ruled supreme in that place. That's the way it's going to be. That's the way it was in the papal states, and that's the way it's going to be all over the world in the New World Order. There was no written constitution, not even a collection of precedents from which the citizens could learn the extent or the nature of the privileges con uh, conceded to them. Whatever of fundamental law there was could be found only in the decrees, canons, and constitutions of councils and of the bulls and briefs of the popes published in a language which none but the educated nobility could understand. In other words, they were written in Latin. Nobody could read or understand Latin. Nobody, that is, of course, except the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. It says, Ecclesiasticism absorbed all secular as well as all spiritual power. Cardinals, prelates, and priests were a privileged class and did as they pleased. On one occasion, a priest, quote, endeavored to induce a hackman to take, uh, to take him at a lower than the usual fare. In other words, this is a, this is a, a private entrepreneur. Uh, apparently, I don't know what a hackman is, but obviously he was going to uh, take this prelate somewhere uh, for a fee, and the prelate, this priest, endeavored to uh, pay him less than he required. Okay? It says, on one occasion, a priest, quote, endeavored to induce a hackman to take him at a lower than uh, a lower than his usual fare, unquote, and upon his refusal to do so, he was imprisoned for several weeks. Okay, that's how the priests operated in the papal states. Okay, they were the elite, and if you were driving a taxi and you were hailed down by one of these prelates of the Roman Catholic Church and your fare was so many dollars to take him across town, and he refused to pay it, you couldn't kick him out, okay? You had to take whatever he offered you at the end of the trip, all right? They were completely immune from any moral or civil law, all right? And it says, as, as late as 1851, Bertol, uh, Bertolotti... Inquisitor General of the Holy See published a papal edict defining certain crimes to which penalties were affixed and the duties of informers. Okay? So they had their own laws, their own penal laws, and they instructed people to rat out other people. Okay? That was part of the system. And it says these included, quote, all heretics all guilty of any acts which can be inferred a compact, express, or tacit with the devil, <laughs> all who should, quote, hinder in any manner whatever the proceedings of the office of the Holy Inquisition, 
all who published writings against the high priests, the sacred colleges, the superiors, ecclesiastics, or against the regular orders, that is, you couldn't say anything in writing against anybody associated with the Roman Catholic Church, and it says, all who without license retained writings and printings which contained heresies or the books of heretics. I mean, you, you, were, <laughs> you were held in violation of these laws if you had a copy of your own Bible, okay? And it says, all who have, quote, eaten or given to others to eat meat, eggs, or latticini, that is a milk product, on forbidden days in contempt of the precepts of the church, unquote. Now, remember, we're talking about how life was in the papal states. What would life be like if we were all controlled by a, an infallible pope? All we have to do is look at, at, at conditions as they existed in the papal states to see how, how this new world order is going to appeal to us. All right? And as encouragement to informers, it was provided that, quote, Whoever fails to denounce the above criminals to the Holy Inquisitor and special delegate against heretical pravity shall be subject to excommunication, unquote. So there's coming a time in this new world order that anybody who suspects you of heresy will be themselves threatened with excommunication and eternal damnation if they don't turn you in. In other words, turning you in will be a divine act. Giving you up to the Holy Roman Inquisition will be doing God's service. Okay? That's the way it's going to be in the New World Order. That's the way it was in the Papal States. Now, what trifling with sacred things. Under this paternal government, if a poor Italian should have written one single word against a profligate priest, who might have tried to rob his home or his most of his most precious treasure, or should have been found with a, God forbid, a Protestant Bible in his house, or a history of the American Revolution, or the life of George Washington, or the Constitution of the United States, or the Declaration of Independence, he would have been arraigned before the Holy Inquisitor, punished as a criminal, shut out from the church by excommunication and visited with the wrath of God for violating his divine commands. And this several centuries after the close of the Middle Ages, after the world has been lifted out of the darkness into the light. What a stark contrast it was at the time after Protestantism had gained its influence in the world what a dark, dark place the Papal States were. The old world order as it existed, even after the Protestant Reformation. And now the Protestant Reformation is going to be put down and that old world order restored. <laughs> 